To gear and beer today our guest is mike seal from bridgewater virginia i remembered it uh cheers yes, brother cheers uh, thanks for having me on man i'm gonna go ahead and call myself out for having a technicality on the first uh segment of this episode and it's now been lost to forever uh so sorry for being the worst hey man but, that was a good warm-up um you've got this guitar here and we were talking about that before i uh stopped the fake segment that never happened so why don't you just start right off and talk about that bad oh, boy man man i'd love to this uh this guitar is a ibanez uh fr and it has a number but i can't remember it how old is the guitar man i've had this one for like seven years something like that okay. and i want to say that i'm not sure if they make the same exact model anymore i think it maybe changed over time okay. the first one i had it was also a fr something it was a red one with a pick guard on it and uh it had different pickups but it had the same neck and body uh shape and that's it, a very uh th- that's what i would call the ibanez neck yeah for sure that's kind of a little wider and like yeah thin but not too thin yeah exactly it, it feels really thin after playing like a strat or a telly or does something. it is is it one of those necks that has the metal plate through it uh, I don't know about that. Oh no, because you, um, you can see it. It's not. I yeah, know, I, I, I held it just earlier, but fretboard or fingerboard and and neck, but um, but yeah, it is like you described, like f- flat and pretty thin. It's too. there's some uh, SGs ha- from like uh, late nineties and uh, t- uh, two thousand to through two thousand ten had some necks that felt a lot that like same that profile yeah, yeah it's yeah, a really, really cool thin. profile yeah, i man. like it it's light to play it's i fun. don't have anything like that man well you pick this thing up and you know how heavy it is but it's got yeah. an ash body it's like the lightest neck ever but it's got the heaviest body so it's actually a that is the one thing about playing this guitar it's like it's it's a lot of weight um compared well, to and, a lot of other axes as you showed uh before the all the the different sounds that it can get if you, you want to go through that yeah for sure for yeah it's got a five-way switch so it has these two humbuckers but it's got a five-way switch um and i guess it coils taps on two and four i don't know if that's exactly what's happening but it gives kind of an out of phase sound on two and sure four. i wonder if it if one of them taps yeah I, I, don't, I don't know i'll just go through all of them that one i really like that middle one i love a good a middle set middle pickup yeah yeah you can get some awesome town uh, uh Honky. Tone, yeah and it doesn't uh one thing i like it doesn't really drop the gain so much between sure. the diff- all five of them you know a lot of pickups like two and four get really quiet but um these are pretty even on those it almost seems louder yeah yeah and here's a four. position two here's the top one though pretty it's a really dark kind of signature on these uh, pickups they're kind of they're kind of rounded off even like i've got the treble dimed all the way up but it's you know and that's crazy because this is it's an exceptionally bright amp, but you, it, it's it's still like clear, very clear sounding. If that makes sense. Yeah, like it's o- got, open sound. Absolutely. Yeah, I think it's got a lot dark. of yeah, it got a lot of clarity. And if you go over to the like neck pickup, it's pre- or sorry, yeah, the bridge pickup. I mean, it's, it's pretty. It bites pretty good. Like, no, I'm sorry. Can you, can you mic a little more? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. So how's this? Oh no, it's that's all good. better. That better. Yeah, if you get down to the um the bridge pickup, it's pretty. Good. That's the brightest char- character that it has versus like this pretty rounded off. Yeah, that the bridge on that it's spanky. Yeah, it's got some some bite to it, which I like. Yeah, that's um, that's a really cool sounding guitar. Man, it's fun. It, yeah, it's versatile. It's good for the road. It's good for doing a lot of different types of gigs and having the tone that you want. Do you take anything else? Yeah, sometimes, man. I take uh, what um, 
in the uh, on, on the way, I've got a a Telecaster coming from the C- Fender Custom Shop. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, I'm excited about trying that out and taking it on the road. But right now, I usually just take this and um, if I have a take a backup, I've got this Benedetto Benny is the model. I don't know the model. I'm familiar with the the builder. Man, it's cool. It's not like their big arch tops. It's a uh, thin body. And it, it is chambered. It has a couple hollow spots in it, but the, okay. it's a closed top. There's no opening, no oh, F, no okay. F-holes or anything. Yeah. And um, you can get some cool tones out of that. And it has a button that does actually cool tap on one of the... It's just oh, a okay. tone knob, a volume knob. The tone knob has a button that you can press and then... Is it yeah. like like a 135 style body or... It actually it lo- almost looks like a like a Les Paul body shape, like oh, the okay. pro- overall profile, but it's, yeah. it's like flared out. It's like its own thing. Benedetto y. Yeah. But it, but the cutaway and the top are almost like a Les Paul. Man, uh who did I somebody I used somebody from back back home used to play a Benedetto and it was the first time I ever saw one. I just remember how freaking good it sounded. Yeah, they're really well crafted, like And it was like a yeah. single pickup, like arch toppy kind of like yeah it, it was intended for a straight ahead and Absolutely. You know, that's yeah. kinda it. Dude, I think Pat Martino had benedetto stuff at the end towards the end i know he, he used, really he used to play a really weird custom guitar like like the 90s like um like video educational pat martino video that came out then where I he's got a tur- turtleneck that. um he's like playing this crazy he said it was super heavy but this like glossy it looks like it has like shellac on it or something it's like crazy looking it's weird it's like one of a kind guitar but i think later on there was like a, a benedetto pat martino model or something really? like that i think i think so don't quote me on that that guy, uh, I often grow tired on what I would call like machine gun solos, which is just like yeah, just know, sixteen notes it and, yeah. until it's from beginning to end. I never grow tired of listening to him play. Oh, that. he was that's such how a he plays of it. for sure. It's a really cool characterization, I think, because uh, my older brother um, and I ha- have these conversations about Pat Martino and Tony Rice. Yeah, both being like like machine right hand players that because because he did he just alternate picked through everything but it was his own style and his lines are like legendary like so many people like one of the first things that i ever learned in like lessons from my teacher was this like he had all these kind of like he had all these weird like enclosures and stuff that he would play and um but i, I used to, there was this book called linear expressions and that was like one of the first things my teacher had me work on was going through these like endless lines that he had and i wish i had figured out the right hand more um back then because the art like the bite in his picking attack is so much there like a i feel like there there was a an omni book of pat martino solo like a, you know, oh, it wasn't man. called the omni book but there was like a somebody had a like the whole thing like a just a, a book of pat martino solos like an omni book for charlie parker but it was yeah. called something else um and there was like a particularly uh like a, a really famous origin solo maybe oh, okay yeah man that all sounds cool and i hope there is a book with all that dude i remember a couple of his like i think I, like, I think i'm right he had one that was like he would do this and he also he would do that, that forever note, like yeah yeah exactly he would just do it like for a while yeah, yeah for, that like yeah um, like taking a little nap yeah <laughs> But then the band would go crazy behind him and start totally. playing all this. Dude, there's this great uh, live Pat Martino album, Live at Yoshi's. Yeah. Uh, and dude, rest in peace. The organ player from that record, Joey D. Francesco. Oh, yeah, Joey D. He just passed away like recently. Last week or something. Yeah, man. It broke my heart when I saw that because... Um, dude, that dude is so hip, bro. Yeah, he was such a great player. He was a killer. Like, we were talking about Justin Stanton earlier being an amazing piano player and also trumpet. Uh, yeah. Joey D. was the same way. He was also like wicked trumpet player. I don't trumpet. know that I've ever seen him and, play trumpet. I just know him playing B three and like and kick oh, bass. And and yeah, I know, and he would also do left hand bass. Yeah, yeah, dude. Like on that record, it's uh, him and Pat Martino and um, uh, Billy Hart playing drums. Also passed away. Actually, I think Billy Hart might still be a man. Yeah, I'm gonna get in trouble thinking about who's alive and not anymore. It's tough to recall sometimes who all is and isn't alive. Man, I think Billy Hart's still in in here with us. I hope so. And uh, please, We're gonna for, go please with forgive it. me for saying that. Uh, Man, but yeah, that record is a is a gem, man. I feel like I came across a a video of the late '90s or something, or early 2000s. Uh, when did Pat pass away? 
Oh man, what, it wasn't that long ago. Like what? Four years? I think three, it could have been the early two thousands. It, oh, it, it was a pat. He was okay. older, but it was Joey D, and I can't remember who was playing. But it was just a, like the they were just so happening, and yeah, that's a killer. Record. He was like super animated in the way he was playing, and it was like. You know, you get guys talk about guys that posture when they're playing. Like, this wasn't posturing. This man was just possessed by the music yeah. that was exploding yeah. out of his extremities. Right. Yeah, man. <laughs> He's just kicking yeah, it. Yeah, it's incredible. You know, and all kind of shit, dude. It was yeah. awesome. Yep. I love I love that kind of thing. I love, especially on that instrument, you know? Yeah. Because I, I think I told you earlier, like, I, I'm just so terrible at piano. Oh, man. If it's got strings and frets or a fret board without frets, it's, uh, I can figure it out and give me some minutes and I'll be able to kind of know what's going on. Yeah. I can't even begin to develop a, a single chop on, on the piano as many times as I've tried. And I'm certainly not in a point of trying at this point. So. Man, dude, for me on piano, like that was, that was actually my first instrument when I was five in lessons. Really? So I've played my whole life. But I'm like a good, bad piano player. Or maybe I'm a bad, good piano player. I don't know. I'm probably more on the good, bad piano, piano player side. But um, like I, I really enjoy playing and I do it for fun at home. Um, but I think it's cool because you can see everything in front of you. It's so different from guitar. And I hear what you're saying about strings and frets because like on a guitar, you can play the same note in six places. Like, yeah. like Well, and there's like I've already learned all the shapes and the and and the muscle memory yeah and it's so different than the linear thing and i've got yeah i, I can barely play guitar with these little vienna sausage fingers oh, shit. <laughs> i got like short fingers and they're fat but i have wide palms so i, I have a little bit of a, a little a bit reach. of a reach yeah. oh but, well man we we played earlier in the stuff you were doing you were doing sweeping and all kind of cool stuff on guitar so oh, so I, I wouldn't undersell your guitar playing but it's funny like uh like, i know I, my guitar playing is definitely for sale oh shit <laughs> Man, what well, with piano though, the cool thing is you can see it all. It's it's there, like you can just look at it, like like you said, linearly from bottom to top. It's right. all right there. And so if you know, it, it, I think once you get, you were talking about getting a new piano soon. I'm I, I got when I I'm getting married in a couple of weeks, and then I told them I was gonna hire somebody to go get it, yeah, bring it over here, set it up, and tune it. Yeah, and then it can just live here for a while. I'll get some mics for it, and they can live in there, and I. I've been wanting to record a straight ahead, like my way. I have this, you know, jazz trio uh, with my buddy Ken Perkowitz on bass and Nate Felty on drums. And my buddy Josh Schultz is a keyboard player. And I've long wanted to do like keys, guitar, bass, drums, straight ahead. The tunes like I pick, which, you know, are... uh, cheesily i would have to refer to not so standards but definitely standards and like just make a record of that just here in the basement studio yeah oh man that would be awesome it would be so much fun too and i could i think i think i could make it happen and make it sound good i i would have to I'm going to have to make a couple of, uh, I have to figure a couple of things out, but. <laughs> oh shit, man. Well, I'd like to hear it. I do think when you get that piano, you'll, especially ha- haven't heard you play guitar. I think you'll like take, you, you'll take to it really fast. I hope so, man. I, it's been so long since I lived. I, I had one everywhere I lived in Texas and I didn't move here with one because the first place I lived was tiny. Um, so it's you know i just haven't had a piano i had like a little casio thing but it's not weighted and it's not the yeah. same oh yeah it's nice having the weighted playing the ADHD's. acoustic instrument yeah. and like learning on the acoustic instrument there's something to that and like yeah lo- for sure you know just the the feel and the sound of the piano and learning how to do the things fundamentally on the piano yeah. and then translating them to like organ or stuff that's not weighted which is obviously a different technique but right we're playing a synth or the something. same harmonic yeah. con uh concepts transfer yeah. and that yeah. that's what i need man is figuring that out i know like how what a cool organ thing sounds like but there's no way i could perform it at this point yeah well, let's come cool. up with it it's cool and i you, i know um looking behind the cameras you have a really cool um recording setup going on and i wonder if you've um played with a bunch of like midi plugins for keys and stuff like that uh, man so uh 
not this EP that I just, uh, it's not, it, it comes out uh, October 25th. Uh, but like some of the upcoming stuff I've been doing, uh, just like I've got some, that little mini, mini MIDI keyboard and I've got, yeah. uh, some different synth stuff and I've programmed drums with that thing. Yeah. And you know, it's pretty cool what you can do with it. The, with it stuff. really is. And I use logic and I know that, you know, people, man, Oh, talk shoot, I, bad about logic, but it's, it works and it's really intuitive and it's extremely capable. It's way more capable than what I can do with it. For sure. Oh, sure. I mean, they all are now for, for me, like they're all so advanced, man. Um, but I, uh, I use a uh, Reaper, which is like, yeah, it's like public domain, yeah. public source. Um, I'm familiar with that. Like actually it, it keeps a counter of how many hours you've spent on it. And it's like, it prompts you when you open it, like you can donate if you want, but, or you can just use it for free, but it always gives you the thing. Yeah. And after like, it like tells you Italian. I think I had gotten up into the thousands of hours and I looked at, it, I was like, man, I need to like pay them back. Throw a little so I finally, just for like peace of mind so I can sleep at night, I finally get, gave them some cash I, I had that for a minute um but when i got uh this computer a couple of years ago i was like oh, i'll just go ahead and get logic because i heard good things and yeah it's cool it's amazing what you can do i mean like and the i think the basic functionality across all those daws is pretty pretty similar and i know a lot of people who use logic and i mean it's it's one of the main uh, awesome it seems so. like all of the people who are professionals don't use it they use pro tools yeah pro yeah. tools but it also seems like they all bitch about Pro Tools. <laughs> well, it's funny too. If you're flying stuff, I think since the pandemic, especially when people are starting to fly a lot more stuff, yeah. not that it wasn't happening before, but uh, now if you're just sending a WAV file or whatever or stems, it's like sometimes it doesn't matter so much what program it came from if the capture is good. That's true. Yeah. Just, you know, label things properly and yeah. get the peaks where they're supposed to be. And yeah. I'm still learning about all this stuff, man. I'm a dude. Me too. Novice. I mean, I, I mixed and mastered the two EPs that I released. I don't know what I'm doing. No idea, man, man. It's funny you said, cause uh, I only, I've only ever put out one thing and that was an acoustic EP. And I was, um, I was going to be a guitar instructor at the Tommy Emanuel guitar summer camp or something like 2018 or something, maybe like that. Um, and so I knew it would be a great opportunity to have something to sell merchandise. Sure. So, um, I recorded mine at home with the uh, AT 4033. Yeah. Uh, a or something i don't know if it had yeah it. that's, that's okay. right um and then i had a uh, that's what these are. um i had a uh, like a fathead microphone which i still have those my, my brother which, which fathead i can't remember i think the, are those the ones that are shaped like the, the gold one i think so well, it was they, like they a make circle a with like a stem coming yeah so down. that's that's what's on this amp in here it's a, a cascade okay. fathead okay a fathead cascade which is the ribbon mic Man, it was something like that. And at this time for me, those were borrowed mics from my um, brother-in-law, Tyler Bryant, who's an amazing guitar player. And he's got a really cool studio at home. And um, this uh, engineer, mixing engineer named uh, uh, Roger, uh, who who did did mix the a record for me. But it was just a single EP and I recorded, yeah, basically everything at home. Um, was it just acoustics and like uh, layers of acoustics or did you have yeah, other players? I did eight track uh, eight tracks all myself. Um, four of them are just solo acoustic and four of them I tracked as two acoustics with like very slight panning oh, okay. um, and separate, separate capture just to, cause I had some, tune, like I had to do it really fast. I did it like in a, I think in like five or six days at home. Oh, nice. And it didn't cost me anything to do that until, sure. until I got to mixing and mastering. So yeah. I really appreciate what people are making. I also like, I feel kind of bad that I haven't made anything since then. So I have like a new, uh, pretty soon, at least in the next year or two, Hope to have like a a couple other things out. That Hell yeah, dude! I mean, uh, the the voice on the instrument that you have, you need to be putting that junk out. Oh man, thanks a lot. Uh, uh, I I told you earlier that you know we actually just met and I I saw whatever Carter video. I, I think I, I think it was the Naima one that I saw first. Okay, cool. Um, but I was just like, a guy in Nashville is playing Naima. I was like. <laughs> who is this unicorn man? And, and then I, uh, watched all the other Carter videos and I was like, this son of a bitch can do everything. I'd need to meet. Uh, I wish, man. <laughs> I wish I, I can do a little she, bit of a lot. Yeah, of I'll things, be linking but... all those Instagram videos. Y'all just be <laughs> checking the notes like usual, man. Well, I love guitar. You know, I grew up like playing and listening to guitar. And so I, I've 
like hearing different styles and stuff like that. I'm definitely not a master of, of any of them, but I like just trying to pick up little pieces here and there. Do you remember what piece you were playing uh, on that 67 330? It's like, a, um, doom, doom, oh, doom, that, doom, that's doom, my that's one of my tunes actually. Oh, that's that on that um, such a dope song, man. Thanks, man. That's on that uh, EP I was talking about. Too. Is that out that's, there? Yeah, yeah. It's on okay. I'll EP. put a, I'll link to it. It's on uh, Spotify and all that. Okay, Just yeah. I'll definitely Mike link Seal. to that. Um, it's called Danger Ranger. Is the song? It's like um, oh, uh, right, here we go. You can play it really fast, so you can do like. It's like a, it's almost like a, it's like just a little rhythmic figure, and then you can put the melody over it. So the rhythmic figure is like the, and it's just kind of that, and then you put the melodies like, um, kind of slurred through it, but like um, um I see. I get it. The space is with the melody. It's almost easier to play it fast and tap your foot really hard, but you can get that. Um, there, there's like a bridge, like um. <laughs> but, I mean, like, I, that's so awesome, dude. Man, thanks a lot. I, that's I, cool. I'm playing it kind of sloppy, but like, um, it's fun because the melody's just like a little bit like bare bones thing. You can kind of play whatever around it, so then you know. That, I mean, I I see what you're saying. You'd like kind of get in between the rhythmic figure with the melody. That's yeah. It's That's fun a, to play with the band too, man. I've been lucky to play with a lot of like trios and like different different uh, configurations. But this uh, group with Jeff Sipe, the Jeff Sipe Trio, is a band I got to play them for like over ten years now or something. Uh, okay, with him and a really gifted bass player named Taylor Lee. Um, I don't know those guys. Man, Jeff Sipe's a killer drummer. He's got a nickname. That name sounds familiar, he, dude. He was the drummer for uh, the Aquarium Rescue Unit, mm. which was like uh, Jimmy Herring, Colonel Bruce Hampton. Um, uh, O'Teal Burbridge, his brother Kofi Burbridge, yeah, and like uh, all kind of myriad guests over the years. Rest and in stuff. peace. Yeah, rest in peace. Um, but yeah, he's a, just a shredder drummer, like amazing. Okay, that's, yeah, that's why I recognize that name because um, I'm certainly familiar with that group. And uh, like, uh, wouldn't Kevin Scott or some? You know Kevin Scott? He yeah, was playing I do. With Jimmy, right? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, they played both played together in Jimmy Herring's. Uh, I think a couple configurations of Jimmy okay. Herring band. Yeah, right, right. that's yep. dope. Um, I think we're good on time. Uh, so oh, I, was to, I was about to ask you, um, I can't remember. So, so there's, there's like I, at least four Carter videos, right? Naima and is all the rest of it. Is that your stuff? Uh, I think all of them were covers except, um, that one that we were just talking about. Okay, I can't yeah. remember off the top of my head when anything else was, uh, Gotta think about the, the Birdland, which was Naima, or the uh, the no, the Super Four Hundred. That yeah, that was the Naima on the Super Four Hundred. Um, oh, I did a Ray Charles tune. I can't remember what if it was on a three thirty five or what, but it was like uh, "Busted" by Ray Charles. I don't know that tune. It's like. three four it's a cool tune man. yeah uh, um there's a cool schofield version of that too that's where i heard it the first time oh, actually okay. well i heard the ray charles version but that's the first time i was like heard it as an instrumental thing. are you a big schofield, schofield guy yeah i grew up listening to a lot of that and um i feel I, like you as soon as you mentioned schofield i was like i think i can hear the tiniest bit of that influence in your phrasing man you know I, what i love about him is like his sound and his um writing and everything changes over time like over decades you got have the, these got different the arc of baby it. got that yeah. art yeah he's always reinventing himself and but he still has that core center of what he does too man you may you may have seen this but are you familiar with the 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 live from uh lincoln concert that he did with soft and loud jazz two different bands um i remember sets. the era that was like what like late 80s or something when he had the loud jazz record come out i, yeah. I haven't heard the um, okay so this version. was from like 2010 or something okay and he had he played like straight ahead -y, like a smoother softer yeah schofield and then uh i forget that was like jeff ballard and uh guys like that and then yeah. it was dennis chambers on the second 
second yeah, band. And, and Den- the ones that Dennis were on. Yeah, it was like the guys ones. from that from yeah. that uh, loud jazz record were playing awesome. in the second set. I forget awesome. who else was in that, but man, they had pick hits live too back in the day with Dennis Chambers on it. Um, Jim Beard, um, Dennis Chambers, and um, I'm drawing a blank on the. Yeah, Pickett's is from uh, that Blue Matter record, right? Uh, I th- well, I think it's a tune from that record, but then they also released an album called Pickett's Live. That's oh, okay. a live version of all that stuff. Oh, um, okay. I, I might get, I might be conflating a couple ones, but um, I'm gonna have to look back and, and reference that. Uh, let's pause for a moment. All right. Deer and beer. Uh, like uh, my wife's band, man, they work really hard on the social media front and just like having an infrastructure around their band where they have like the right management and booking and all those things. So they're con- they're just like from 8 a.m. till 4, even when they're not touring, they're just always. It, it seems like uh, in you know, all my different traveling through different artists and whatever, it's like a lot of people have management that don't do anything for them. It's just like, what is the point? Yeah, I think it's almost like a band member, you know, if you find a, somebody who's going to like really do the right thing for you, but they also have to get the right thing from you as well. Like, yeah, you know, they have because they're going to make money because of what you're doing. So it's like it's a two way street. And if, if you get that right symbiosis, it's it, really cool. It definitely requires work on both ends. You have to work at whatever it is you're delivering, just like they have to work at it, whatever selling, whatever it is that you guys yeah. have agreed you're going to deliver. And yep. But it's a funny role. It's definitely been ostracized in like movies and stuff like that. Like there's the trope almost of a bad manager kind of like greedy. Well, it's, taking I think it's a, of the band. because it's like unfortunately common. Like yeah, when I think <laughs> like even, like this most recent Elvis movie, which I haven't seen yet, but I was reading reviews about it and um, people were telling me like Tom Hanks plays this really kind of like uh, he plays Colonel Parker, right? Yeah, he plays. He plays the manager, right? Yeah, Colonel Parker. Is that that was Elvis's? Okay. Yeah. So I guess it's pretty like, like a danger. You know, he he maybe wasn't so great for Elvis at times. Like, oh no, I think that's historically uh, been talked about a lot. Okay. Oh right, yeah, I guess it's vetted out, right? And, yeah. Uh, but it's kind of crazy, right? And you hear that in so many that like, really controlling and manipulative, and, yeah. and, and like forceful about, you know. They just, they're, the the manipulation helps them see how, where your weakness is, and then they seize that somehow, whether, you know, whatever yeah, it is, right. who's, who's to say. But, but it's, it's funny that the good managers don't get represented very much in movies, too, you know, it's like. Well, that's because they're, uh, nobody's, nobody's singing songs for the good guy behind the scenes. It's yeah. only the. Uh, guy that you hear about later ruined this thing that you used to like. Yeah, <laughs> or yeah whatever. That's right. That's, right. <laughs> that's pretty good. <laughs> Shit. So, uh, you know the the name of thing. Uh, wh- how long have you been into like jazz and that? Was that something that uh, school turned you on to, or is that something that you got turned on to because you? were drawn to it man I, I was drawn to it but it was a mentor it was this guy mark wetzel in um harrison Ver- harrisonburg virginia he was my guitar teacher when i was like 14 through 18 like until i went to college basically um and i it was serendipitously lucky for me like um you might eat that mic a little more oh me. yeah sorry Something. um like long story short, I went into a guitar shop when I was like 14 to buy strings or something, you know, like there with my mom in uh, Harrisonburg, Virginia. Yeah. And I heard this guy playing all this jazz stuff, like all these, or just all these different voices and stuff. I think he was the altered voicing. Yeah, he was using all the extensions and all this cool oh, stuff man, and playing I love through that shit things. So much. He was just noodling around there, and it turned out it was a um a guy that my dad knew, this dude Mark Wetzel. And uh, my dad worked in the Harrisonburg County or Harrisonburg City school system. And Mark was a teacher over there, too, oh, okay. and had been a student like 20 years before or something like that. Like, uh, long story short, though, he he was just a great um, jazz player. And uh, I heard that and I was like, man, I want to learn how to do that. And so I like my mom called him and asked if I could take lessons when I was like 14. And I remember uh, he was like, well, I might can fit him in. You know, we'll we'll try like once every other week or something like that. And I remember just really wanting to impress this dude because I heard the stuff he was playing and I was like, man, I want to learn that. But at the time I was listening to Dream Theater 
Alice in Chains, Hell like yeah, Metallica. Um, Alice in Chains is the shit, man. Dude, I had all this. I had the Tripod Dog album. Like I had a like a boombox that I was like playing all this stuff on. I was into Led Zeppelin. I was into um, lots of different rock and roll music. Um, and this was like the late nineties, probably like mid to late nineties. So that was, I mean, the the nineties were such a weird time, and I always talk about this on the both on this podcast and in real life to people who are tired of hearing it, but you haven't heard me say it there's something to the culmination of all the different facets of uh what i guess we'd have to call commercial music just like widely available popular music but for every genre country jazz hip-hop pop what you name it Uh, the songwriting was as progressive across the board as ever i mean think about like uh brian white and winona from the late 80s and the early 90s and just like bro just mod after mod and like ever every song is modding and back and forth oftentimes and like just all the crazy complexity of the harmony that they're playing and then you go to uh just your standard pop music and you still find diminished chords. And yeah, sure. Like uh, Stone Temple Pilot songs. You know, you listen through the chord progressions of those songs. There's a like lot of Like Interstate cool Love Song? Yeah, yeah. So uh, I learned this recently. Uh, oh, that's the one with the slide, right? Is that the... It's slide at the beginning. Yeah. But yeah. the verse is like uh, C sharp minor, and then it's... Uh, uh, C half diminished, or what, if you want to think about it, is like a a, a flat dominant chord. Oh, okay, yeah, it's got some stuff in and it, and then right? it's yeah. like F sharp over B. Okay, and, uh, and then I think it's another. Uh, it's either G flat dominant or B flat flat five. Or Man, whatever. but yeah, they had they had cool chord progressions and stuff going on in it. Bass yeah. player wrote that. Ah, uh, that's really cool. The man. the the Robert DeLeo, the other DeLeo. He actually, uh, I follow him on Instagram because he's one of my favorite musicians of all time. He's also a super cool dude. Uh, just from just briefly in, in having interchanges with him on on Instagram, but uh, some luthier in Brazil gave him the guitar that he was just. He gave him this guitar and he was just playing it and it came up with that chord progression that oh, turned into cool, Interstate man. Love Song. That's really cool. And like a, a few months ago, he posted a video of him playing that guitar and being like, this is the guitar that I wrote the changes to Interstate Love Song on, blah, blah, blah. Oh, that's awesome. And like played it. It was so cool. Like I, I'm a, I'm totally giddy about dorky stuff like that. Oh, I love it too, man. The reason that I have this 65P bass that it's my main bass is because uh, I know for... Uh, I, at one point that's what he was playing in 65 they had there's apparently a thing where um there were ebony boards and and some of them were pal Faro, and i think he had a pal Faro board oh, okay. on his p base it's like just kind of what's pal Faro? uh some sort of brazilian wood P okay. P A U F E R R O. I think okay. all right it's just the kind of wood is that's uh, cool uh but it's just I just I loved his tones and I love the I've always described his bass playing as like counter melody, you know? Mm-hmm. Because Yeah, there's that counterpoint in their songs like totally. Well, and like and he's playing through the he's like playing arpeggio lines through the changes and Dean's chunking chords. Yeah. And then he's also like staying out of the way of the the vocal melody yeah. and and still locking in with the drums and being busy because there's only three instruments essentially yeah and there's there's an art to playing trio awesome. man on the bass uh as i have learned and maybe uh i've certainly been called a busy bass player before but people tell me all the time that i don't play bass like a guitar player which is what i hope to hear yeah <laughs> but there's there's i just feel like there's an art to that really small oh, sure. instrumentation like sounding big because as we all know there's parts upon parts upon parts and yeah. records and you oh, have man, to start like, picking and choosing at a certain point dude the trio is such a powerful thing that we were talking earlier about like the chick Korea stuff on the jazz side but yeah. like 
man, what about all the great rock bands? Like Dude. Led Zeppelin is a trio basically with a vocalist, right? Yeah, like, well, look at that over there on that wall is the best trio of all time. Oh yeah, opinion. Rush. Yeah, I'm, of course. A, I mean, it's amazing. Yeah, I'm so I'm such. A, yeah, dude, Rush was the shit. I'm a Rush Homer, as they would say. Yeah, I'm not, man. even though I'm not from Canada, dude. I've been since sixth grade. I I had the Counterparts album, and man. it's been over since then. That's awesome. I've owned every single Rush record on CD probably twice. Hell yeah. And I currently possess none of those. Dude, have you, uh, <laughs> man, I hope I'm not getting the wrong band for this show, but have you ever seen uh, Trailer Park Boys? Yes. Aren't they, isn't, one, isn't like Bubbles a giant Rush fan? Y- yeah. And they, and they bring they, him into the show. Yeah, like, they kidnap Alex Lyson. Yeah, at that's one point right. In that's that right. Show. Okay, I'm glad I got the right band on <laughs> that, not man. the first time it's yeah. been brought up on this podcast. Okay, okay. Dude, I love that. I watched, uh, I didn't expect to like that show so much, but I ended up. Um, Dude, it's so funny. It gets kind of weird at the towards the end. It's where I am now. And like, the, oh, yeah. I think they're still making it. Oh man, I got to catch up then because I watched it a couple years ago. Like during the pandemic, I just turned one on, and then like next thing I knew, I'd watched them all in a, like a month or something. And there's this thing that I do, and I don't know if it if anybody else does this, and and if you don't, I I think everyone should try it. There's this thing that I have where I don't watch a lot of TV. I love TV. I love movies and stories and things like that. And I used to watch it all the time. I just been kind of like forcing myself to be more productive with my times to try to ch- change the trajectory of things but every night before i go to bed i turn on something that is stupid and funny and it's i'm a little sleepy and i'm just kind of sitting on the couch and i'm winding down and not only do i find do, do i laugh out like i can watch something in the middle of the day and be like this is hilarious and not laugh once. Oh yeah but i'm i laugh out loud every night before i go to bed and i just feel like i just sleep so good oh yeah man you gotta you gotta have something to laugh it's just like yeah. just a little a nightcap laugh i like it Seinfeld I, I like or the lot, office man. or whatever yeah. pick your poison yep. you know just silly stupid shows but also like extremely funny uh Parks and Rec is another good one. Oh Dirty yeah, Rock. I love it. Yep, yep. Arrested Development. I find all the uh, Trailer Park Boys. And have you seen? I think you should leave with Tim Robinson. I haven't seen that. Oh, bro, I'm trying. I've you seen all that. the other ones you mentioned, but I haven't seen that. I think you should leave with Tim Robinson. Is the most absurd, amazing show I've ever okay. seen. And we'll talk more about that. Okay. Later. All right. Um, but. Uh, what the fuck were we even talking about before I tangent I think we, it so hard? Uh, we started on Naima, and then I started talking about my old guitar teacher, and I was I was trying to say that he was a great like a jazz dude, but then I got distracted thinking about other stuff like '90s music. But uh, oh, but a, that's a right. nice tie-in with that man. This uh, this teacher of mine, man, I couldn't shout him out enough because I I think if it weren't for this like one person for me, he was like a mentor. Um, I don't think I would even play music as a career at all. Really. Because he like okay every uh, I he I told him that I wanted to learn jazz stuff, and I was listening like I was saying I was listening to like Dream Theater and things like that, and um, I think he knew I was serious about it because he would give me all this stuff, and I would go home and like religiously work on it, and I would practice like five hours a day and stuff like that, and my goal was to like come back in and show um show him that I had put the time in, and at the same time I was like infatuated by the music, sure. so he opened up this whole door, and and like at that time in my life I was just obsessed with like jazz guitar and learning about um jazz music for the first time like the first lesson he had me um he was like okay well transcribe miles davis um his trumpet solo on kind of blue um uh on so what from kind of blue um so and i would go in there and he would give me a plastic bag full of burned discs and sorry to all the artists that i love whose albums i got on a burned cdr uh you know it's just kind of a rite of passage, man. Yeah, you weren't you weren't getting that disc going. Fuck Miles Davis. You're getting yeah, yeah. that that disc going. Oh my God, this is changing my life. And I think that Miles Davis right. would be okay well, with it. Well, man, I went on to buy a lot of people's stuff because I would get Same. those. So that that was a good Same. thing. But like, but that's that was the experience. And you for buy me. merch and you buy tickets. Yeah, you, you know when you can, and, dude. And I had grown up like um, learning to read music. Like I learned to read. Uh, music on piano when I was five. My older brother did that before me. He's four years older. Okay. And so I just like followed his track in music lessons. And so we learned like, you know, we learned like, um, 
But I mean, on piano, you know, they're like, yeah. We, we were playing stuff like that and learning sonatinas and, and yeah, stuff, we, yeah. Oh man, that, I wish I had like really learned it back then. I, I, I still got some like uh, etude books over there that I used to be. I can't. I'm pretty bad at reading these days, but man, I have to. I always have to get back into it. But but I grew up reading, so it's like a comfort, a, a bit of a comfort zone. But like um, from this classical teacher, um, this lady named Nancy Hackman, my brother and I took lessons from her like once a week from when we were like five, what well, like maybe seven. Our first piano teacher died. And we switched to her, but from like second grade through like, I don't know, eighth grade or ninth grade, we would, we would do like a 30 minute piano lesson and learn classical stuff. And she was awesome. She had trained in this conservatory and like knew her stuff, even though she had, she was so arthritic, she couldn't really play anymore. Oh damn! And like, dude, she would fall asleep. She, she's passed away. And I, uh, I say all of this in her honor, not to, not to make fun of her at all, but like she would fall asleep during the lesson. Like she was really robust and she could just like lay her chin down on her like bosom and just like be falling asleep and like we were working on this stuff and for us it was really hard it was like we're reading this stuff like well, is that a c sharp or a d how many ledger lines has that got yeah. and then but like you know you can like flip a couple pages and then bang hit the last note you miss and she like knew she would just she knew and she had this little like miniature collie dog that she had in a cage in the kitchen she put it up during like the a sheltie yeah, something like that. I mean, it was a little tiny. It looked like a, uh, yeah, it was a miniature collie. Is that? Uh, I don't know that they make miniature collie. I make that they those <laughs> yeah. exist. Yeah, but well, they, they shelties look like miniature collies. Okay. I grew up with shelties. Okay, well, man, this dog had all kind of energy, but it was locked in a cage while she taught all her lessons. So, like that, you knew that dog. We went, we went in there at like seven p.m. for ours. And it would be like a 15 minute guitar lesson and a 30 minute piano lesson. Oh. She didn't really like teaching guitar as much, but she could read like an ace, man. And she had really good ears. I don't know if she had perfect pitch or not, but she knew when we messed up, like she was always following along. So she talked. Do you have to, perfect pitch? I have, I have like slightly imperfect pitch, I think, or I've, something like. I have what I think is called relative pitch. Yeah. Relative pitch is like you can recognize intervals from any note. Um, but yeah. But yeah well, man, I have that too, but I meant like. I can, if at any point I hear a song and I know what, I hear something that I know what the note is, I'm pretty much good for the rest of the day and I can hear something and figure out like, Man, what we, that note is. You may have perfect pitch. You know, there's a lot of like speculation. I don't, you should hear me sing. Man, the, this is why I don't tell people that I do have it. Cause like when I, I don't tell people that, um, and I don't think I really have People with super perfect pitch are like I got machine some of those buddies. like, and you can like clank your beer, and he'd be like, "That's F sharp." Yeah, <laughs> but I can hear a note and get get really close, and um, I can get my guitar in tune without using a tuner and stuff like that. Um, but, but sometimes if somebody will be like, "Hey, what was that?" and I'll be like, and like freeze brain. So, um, Kofi Burbage, this great um keyboardist I used to tour with. Um, I got to tour with him in this band. Oh, you tour with Kofi? Yeah, he That's was awesome. He dude. was playing keys for Jeff Coffin's Mutet in oh, okay. like 2010 when I joined that band. That was with Felix Pastorius on bass and uh, Jeff Sipe on drums. Okay, yeah. And uh, Kofi had really great ears. He heard everything, and I remember asking him about it. And he was like, "Sometimes I just wait a second and listen to a note, and before I'm just like instantly say it." But he also like could, I don't know. So I'm, I'm blurring the the lines of what i was trying to say but like no i mean, it's 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 interesting because there i i think that you were trying to say there's like kind of degrees of perfect pitch so to speak yeah i think there's a lot of people with perfect pitch that don't realize that they have it and i think there's a lot of you know people with ears in any way that are better than they think they are um but but yeah i I would hate to have the rigid so i got a buddy back uh home that has like what i would call like extremely rigid perfect pitch where if he's singing with an ensemble and the ensemble starts to go a little bit flat he just can't oh yeah yeah he just he can only sing like the correct pitch and so he will then sound out of tune man yeah I, i guess it could drive drive some people crazy I, everyone that I know that says that, and he's also that guy that like, you know, he can sit over there in the corner facing the wall and you can play whatever on the piano and he can tell you C, C5 or, you know, whatever. Yeah. Yeah. Like, I don't know that I need, I don't know that I need that. <laughs> <laughs> but me personally, anyway. So you're, 
wh- who are you listening to at that time when you started taking from Mark Wetzel? Was it stuff that he was pointing? Uh, that Dude, was that well, Mark th- Wetzel? this ties back. Yeah, Wetzel. Yeah, um, this ties back into what you were talking about. The the 90s is the great like conflagration of music that was happening at that time. Um, so like he was turning me on to like at first like Miles Davis and a lot of like staple old jazz records, like older stuff. And I remember I had to learn the kind con- yeah, that so what so like a I mean, I still remember that stuff because I had to write it down on paper for the first time and really think about you committed it. Committed that to shit it. to memory, bro. Yeah, Absolutely. yeah, but it was it was cool. Like the stuff he had me working on, I feel like was really helpful for just understanding chord changes and yeah. music. But yeah, the uh, CD wise, like Matheny, Schofield, Mike Stern, um, like Joe Pass, like every like George Benson, like every great. Were you also listening to other stuff then too, or were you just yeah? I like- still yeah, I still enjoy like listening to metal and stuff. Like I was telling you before, my older brother had a metal radio station, so we were oh, listening to like right. Sepultura and stuff like that. I never really learned to play stuff that that stuff proper. Um, but yeah, I was with the like jazz stuff. I was hearing a lot. So, man, uh, I don't think I asked you this earlier. Uh, have you? ever heard of this metal group i think they're from brooklyn but they're called car bomb i don't think so it's really interesting okay i'll All tell right. you That's I'll, something I'll, I gotta check out if, yeah i'll try to remember to uh, i've linked that in a number a number of episodes of this podcast because anytime metal comes up they're like a, a current band they they still tour but they're like a small metal band they're not like okay i got you uh you know whatever max cavalier is doing or whatever uh What's that band called? Gojira or whatever. The Sepultura okay. guys. Max oh, Cavalier yeah, yeah. from Sepultura. He's okay. got another band. Okay. Anyway. Um, I digress. So so you're still you're listening to metal. Are did you ever get into like uh I and I don't I only know a few guys that have, which is why I'm asking. Were you ever into like yacht rock as a younger person? Oh no, but Steely the, Dan and shit. I mean, oh yeah, yeah. Like I heard Steely Dan. I know that's not really yacht rock, but it's the same no, it's era funny. of uh, yacht rock. Like I'd never heard that term until I saw this like YouTube parody oh, thing that came well, out. Hollywood yeah. Steve. Yeah, yeah, it's amazing, dude. right? So I love that first off, but like um Oh my god, those I, are so amazing. <laughs> I mean, that made me love that music even more. Honestly. Totally. But uh, I, I mean, I was, yeah, yeah. Michael McDonald is unreal. Yeah, he said, "Man, you don't. When your friend is drowning in a sea of sorrow, you don't just throw him a life raft. You, you swim, swim one over. over. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's. I mean, that. Yeah, that's your crazy. shitty music made me barf. Yeah. Loggins, <laughs> yeah. <Fucking> Loggins. <laughs> I mean, that was great. Oh, those but are amazing. Dude, I will link that episode in this in the notes of this oh that whole thing's worth episode. watching man um but i heard steely dan and stuff i mean they also had like a tie over with jazz stuff like i also had a buddy when i was growing up who was a great drummer this guy patrick lynn and he didn't even play music anymore i don't think um as far as i, I know nobody like that those are his drums <laughs> man well dude we would get together and play and his dad was a guitar player and had like a bunch of cool amps and cool guitars like strats and les pauls and all this stuff and um uh he was into steely dan so we would listen to that like riding around in the car and stuff and so i heard that and i know that brecker played on a steely dan record so i thought that was cool because i was listening to michael brecker and um chris potter is actually on a uh a live steely dan record a little bit later on that might be my phone oh uh, okay no that's fine yeah that's me over there sorry about that no, that's all good man um, but yeah i heard that's i mean i heard steely dan for sure uh i wasn't like I didn't, I didn't know about yacht rock really i mean just what was on the radio i, I wouldn't have identified it as that but i was hearing my parents songs. listened to like a little bit of that like my dad was like led zeppelin uh Leonard Skinner, James Gang. Oh yeah, but he, but then he was also into like Dan Fogelberg and James Taylor. And, That's cool. And like uh, Poco and and like weird stuff like that. And then like really like cowboy y Texas country. Oh nice. Robert Earl Keen and Guy Clark and like okay. that kind of all stuff, right, cool. which I also love now. Yeah, it's all great. Um, yeah. But he was also a Steely Dan fan. Yeah. And so I got some Steely Dan. I was like, man, this is crazy. And yeah. I just remember the uh, the uh nah, God, what's the what's the song? I used to I used to do it. Dun 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 I don't know what this is, but this is amazing. Yeah, and yeah. I found I come to find out years later that Donald Fagan's maybe my favorite musician. 
And man, have you ever listened to that li- Alive in America l- live Steely Dan? Uh, I can't. I, I had a live Steely Dan record when I was a kid, and I can't remember if it was one that had Brecker doing a solo on it or if it was uh, Chris Potter. I think Chris Potter is randomly uh, like a saxophone player on a live Steely Dan record. But I have one. I can't remember what I it was I think there's called. only one. Okay, well, man, maybe that was it. It's, it's all bl- a little bit blurry for me because that was a long it's time It's Alive ago. in America. It's like, uh, it's... Dennis Chambers, it's Drew Zing on guitar. Wow. He's a killer band. Oh, dude. And Drew, like, takes some liberty. Did you ever, are you familiar with, like, uh, Wayne Krantz era Steely Dan? Um, No, I didn't know Wayne Krantz ever played with Steely Dan. There, it disappeared from YouTube, but there used to be uh, his solo from Green Earrings. <laughs> But it's like not the Wayne Krantz that you know today. It's like extremely aggressive, cut off sleeve, neon green, long haired, like really aggressive playing Wayne Krantz. Oh, sick. He's like shredding, but I mean, he still sounds like Wayne. Okay. But he's just shredding, bro. And like, I got to hear that. It disappeared off of YouTube. (laughs) I haven't looked for it in a while. We we should definitely try to look for that. Dude. If I, if I find that, I'll definitely link that in the, in the video. Krantz is such a monster, man. Uh, Let's take a quick break and then I'm going to ask you some stupid questions and we'll get you out of here. All right. Sounds good. Dear and beer. Uh, Gingerbread boy. difference in the way it sounds in your ears yeah it's got some some bite to it oddly it, i remember it being the other way but i feel like mine sounded better than that one that's not mine yeah it's got a little more gain on it doesn't it uh, all the shit that is so old i don't know how old it is. it's been sitting in somebody's for a long time. Man, sounds good. I'm looking, looked over when I take in my JMP and uh, I'm going to take them both in. We're going to make sure everything is the same and then I want to hear it and see if because from what I understand it's supposed to be the same. Alright, hell yeah, man. It's a, it's a really interesting amp, man. I'll, man, yeah. it's nice. It's got a lot of clarity to it too. I mean, it's, it's, uh, like the this channel is basically just an AC30. I'm sorry, it's this amp now, but. Um, Yeah, I think it's awesome, man. I just realized this is the wrong homage. The slightest amount. What's that? Did that clean it up any? I mean, I like the grid on it. I was just running, I was running, uh, four hours into eight. Oh, awesome, man. Now, now it's like it's supposed to be. Yeah, I love that, hand, man. That sounds great. Um, all right, so let me ask you some stupid questions. Shoot. Uh, I haven't changed these in a, in a while, so it's the same, it's been the same for a lot of people. Um, Metallica or Megadeth is the first question. Uh, Metallica for me because I listened to a lot more of that when I was a kid. Sure. But nothing against Megadeth. I just hadn't checked it out as much. You should check it out because uh, I love both. But 
Dave Mustaine is an extremely underrated guitar player, and so is Marty Friedman. And heard that uh, guys that have, uh, Chris Poland before <laughs> him from the early days. Man, That's, and I like current Megadeth too, but nothing, uh, you know, nothing yeah. against them. Oh, it's the, not as transformative as the first six records were. Man, the guy they have playing guitar with him now, whose name I'm drawing a blank on at this moment. Uh, Kiko yeah. Moreno or something. Yeah, like that? Moreno. Maybe? Moreno. Yeah, Kiko is? Moreno. I yeah. think that. I think that might be it. Man, what a monster! He's like a gifted like everything player he does like he can play flamenco or yeah I was play about to say, he's like he's got like heavy classical and flamenco yep, stuff going he's got on. the jazz thing in between it he's just got every it's like one of those really well-rounded players so all the respect to him too dude totally uh, that's all i've ever strived to be was like i just like all the styles too i just want to be good at them man i got a good uh megadeth anecdote too uh my buddy taylor lee that plays bass with uh jeff sype trio got the audition uh for megadeth and harry when dave got let go um yeah when they were changing over bass players he he ended up um getting the audition for that and going through the audition cycles but had the uh also the audition for um uh uh harry connick jr at the same time oh wow i just thought that was really badass that he would be called for both of those things that literally sounds like the stuff that my dreams are made of yeah <laughs> yeah that's what because, your uh, spotify playlist had or, yeah dude yeah. it's like either which way that goes like yeah in i'm yeah. in i'm in on that <laughs> yeah i I made a couple calls to try to see if I could get an audition for that, but I didn't know I didn't know anybody connected enough. Actually, that's not true. I do know somebody connected enough because uh, my buddy Chris Rodriguez has sang backup on like the last twenty years of Megadeth records. Wow, including the wow. one that Vinny Coluda played drums on. Oh, that's crazy! Vinny was on a Megadeth thing. Yeah, bro. Oh my god. Oh, dude. Oh. Wow. And you know what? It doesn't sound like Vinny unless you know it's Vinny. It sounds like somebody playing stylistically appropriate drums for a Megadeth record. Incredible. But if you know it's Vinny, you can hear some Vinny in there for sure. It's, Hell yeah. It's a good record, too. That's uh, awesome. System Has Failed is the name of that record. Okay. Also talked about that numerous times just because I'm a broken record. Um, the next question uh, gets a little harder, in my opinion. That's uh, Miles or Coltrane? Oh, man. Oh, uh, that'd be hard to pick. Uh, I mean, I would in a perfect world you would never have to pick, but you're in hell right now and you have to pick. Man, well, my introduction to both of them was at the same time because it was kind of blue and Coltrane plays on that record. Totally, and so like they are equal, equally valuable parts of that record, even though it's Miles' music and he's also setting up a chapter, new chapter of music with that. Uh, uh, Miles wrote everything on that record, right? Yeah, I think so. I know, like I later so. in his career, like that. Uh, uh he, wayne the shorter. sorcerer that i was talking about was like all uh wayne and herbie wrote all the songs yeah man. yeah he would definitely use other people's tunes i think uh famously with the quintet um that had um uh wayne shorter in it yeah, yeah. i think he i think wayne's tunes were a big part of that man um, uh do you know that that wayne tune night dreamer or that the whole record night dream yeah yeah um i've played it before a long time ago and i'm trying to remember exactly how it goes right now i think i could almost play it uh yeah yeah it's like or is it, yeah yeah i mean i used to know it a really long time ago it's been a long time so yeah. like the the main changes are like g major seven f minor seven uh e flat major seven d seven sharp nine and that's the the loop. Yeah. And then it goes uh, E flat minor seven. E flat, yeah. And then E seven sus. Yeah, I like F seven sus. Yeah, so man, it's, like it's almost there for me. It's almost and, there for me. It's been so long. Oh, dude, yeah, I'm, I apologize. Such a yeah. Cool song. Yeah, it's a beautiful song, man. And, uh, he's got so, and he's got some stuff that I just can't listen to. That like super out there, the uh, dying saxophone stuff. You know, I can't, I can't get into that from him or or Coltrane. And that's definitely on me and not them. But I just don't. Oh get yeah, it, well, it's know? a wide thing that they both did i mean they they were very prolific especially coltrane in a like limited number of years put out a lot of different s stuff so yeah. um but yeah hats off to both of them man i i'm sorry i can't say which one i would take man because i have to think hard about it like 
That's a desert island. Yeah, you right just there. have to pick. You just have to pick one. Man. Uh, no further deliberation necessary. All right, I'll the coin. I'll go with Miles because he has so many records out. Yeah, but it's, I, but I mean, that's it's a tough one, man. That's a that's a a well thought out answer, which is all I could ever ask for. Uh, it's going to get harder and then it's going to get easier. Dang. Um, Matheny or Schofield? Oh, man. This is brutal. I love yeah. them both. That's exactly. Uh, I'll go with Sco on this one, but no offense to Matheny. I mean, I Most think- people do, and I think I wouldn't, but I also think I might. <laughs> man. It's I mean, t- I mean say? like I, that's another one I just had to pick. You know, it's, yeah, which way is it's the no bias either way. Moment. Yeah, I would, basically- I would take them both any day. Uh, now it gets less stupid um, and more, and also more stupid. David Lee Roth or Sammy Hagar? Man, I love the. This is easy. David Lee Roth. Mm-hmm. Uh, nothing against Sammy Hagar. I love. I mean, I love it all. But the uh, the acapella version of uh, of David Lee Roth on YouTube is one of the greatest things that's ever happened. Yeah, you're right. The soundboards for ringtones and text tones that yeah. was made from it. Totally. Yeah. Vi or Satriani. Vi, no offense to Satriani. No, that's really. the correct answer. Offense or not. Yeah. That's the correct answer. Um and props to Satriani. He's a badass. I'm yeah, I'm not I'm not taking yeah. anything away from him, but he's a monster. He doesn't do for me uh he his well, he, playing is amazing. His he wasn't music in a crossroads, man. Steve man. He wasn't in crossroads, I'm sorry. Also true. Also true. He also didn't play with Frank Zappa and then yeah. You know, have you listened to the flexible and the flexible, uh, like, outtakes that they released 20 years later? Mm-mm. It's basically just another Frank Zappa record. <laughs> Man, I've got a good uh, Vi Zappa anecdote from my friend Jeff Sight, because um, he was at Berkeley at the same time as Steve Vi. And another good story is that um, Vi gave them his, like, last macaroni and cheese when they were, like, starving or something. He said they invited him, they went up to say hey and... They were all hungry, and he like pulled it out, and he was like, oh, it's my last one, but here y'all have my mac and cheese. But uh, Sype told me that uh, Vi— It felt good to hear that about Steve Vi. Dude, Steve Vi, um, when he was at Berkeley, this is the story I was told anyway, meticulously transcribed Zappa stuff, which was already out, and then like worked up the nerve to call, like look up his phone number and call the house, and got his wife, and was like, hey, I've written out all of Frank's music. I wondered if I could send it there and just get it checked out. And I think this, the story, I, as I heard it, is that um, he sent it in the mail, and Zappa like looked at all of it, and that was the beginning of their um, connection. Nobody, I, I, I can't say that. Transcription is such a feels like such an a way of the past, at least like physical transcription. You know, I mean, people are still learning other <laughs> people's parts, so I don't, I don't mean, I don't mean that, but like the physical transcription, that's like a. I, I get that it doesn't work for everybody, but I think for a lot, of, for different styles of learners, like physical transcription is still beneficial, you know, yeah. thinking yeah. about it, singing it to yourself as you're writing it and uh, making sure that you're writing it correctly and then read it, trying to read it back to yourself. And you're just not only are you committing it to memory, but you're you're training your ear and all, and all that yeah. kind of stuff. And I, yeah. I just don't feel like maybe people are doing that and I just don't realize it, but I mean there, I think there's a professional function in which you have to do it as well, which is just to preserve something that's been recorded, but hasn't been written. And you want to like take it to another band and you want them to be able to play that. So you might write it out. So there, I mean, I think there are applications where it's still used like, yeah, you, you're, you, you're right. But I think that's like among a smaller and smaller and group of people yeah a lot of people that i run into go about things in such a different way and i i feel like that makes me sound like such an old man oh but, no not at all i i agree with you in that um people have such different paths of learning and like styles of learning too and i think with transcribing it it's um it's not very common for someone who's learning to music to actually write it out you know, with a pencil and paper totally, or finale or something on a computer where you're yeah. typing it out. But like, but it does happen. And for me, that was really helpful. That was like assignments that my teacher gave me where I was like, I was okay. bad at those assignments. Uh, I can do it, but yeah. I mean, the amount of time that it would take me now is, Oh, well see, it's easier now because you can slow it down and preserve the pitch, even with like a basic media player That's true. or a internet like streaming 
player. You That's can fair. Do it on, like YouTube, you can slow it down to like quarter speed and That's it'll preserve fair. the pitch. So. I always forget about that. Um, I really need to stop forgetting about that so much. Man, it used to be like you'd have to slow a record down back in the day, you know, and it would change the pitch and then you'd yeah. have to like trans, transpose it. From Man. Th- those, not for the faint of heart. Yeah. And back in those days, that was for the truly dedicated. Yeah. Um, John Petrucci or Paul Gilbert? Oh, shit, man. Well, I like Paul Gilbert. I like both of them, man. Yeah, I know. That's the whole point of all of these. Man. The whole point is you shouldn't have to, but here we are. (laughs) All right. I'll go with Paul Gilbert because he had a great like um, VHS guitar lesson series in the 80s or 90s. You know that tune? Give uh, me a letter. I I always want to call it... uh, Spanish Castle Magic, but that's obviously not the song I'm talking about. It's uh, Curse of the Castle Dragon, I think is what it's called. <laughs> I don't know. I remember. Oh, it, it was a wicked, ripping ass guitar part. I that bet, was like, man. I bet. Yeah. Somebody turned me on to. I like the drill pick, too. The, uh, was that, the, the power was that drill. him first? I thought that was. I don't know who did it first. I mean, from what I understand, Eddie Van Halen stole that from Jimmy Page. Man, I I bet people, as long as there have been drills and guitars, I bet people have been. I have a a guy that I still play with. uh, My buddy Tom uh, still does that. Awesome. It's, he's a, he's a character. He's one of those dudes that like, whatever you got, he can play it better than you. Okay. (laughs) Hell yeah. And that's from everything from harmonica to steel guitar. Awesome. But his main two instruments are... I think guitar and piano, but he's also an incredible, an incredible singer and an incredible, like we, uh, I play a lot of like Vegas cover band stuff with him and like corporate stuff with him. He also does original stuff and he used to be in rascal flats for a minute, but he, uh, we, we played, uh, we were with a bass player who, and we were out at lunch before the gig and the bass player, uh, blues traveler came on the bass player started talking a bunch of shit about blues traveler and then later that night on the gig the last song tom called run around and uh the guy's like begrudgingly playing it or whatever and then tom proceeds to play that john popper solo like note oh, for the harmonic note bro wow, and that's awesome. i was just like melting with laughter <laughs> on that awesome. I, I felt like i felt like a a character a caricature of myself wow because i was laughing so hard dude that's uh, badass but like yeah who, like nobody can play the harmonica like that anymore nobody thinks about the harmonica like that yeah. if they do i don't i don't i don't see them may i'm sure that someone out there is playing the shit out of the harmonica and there's probably a bunch of some ones but those bunch of some ones need to like be doing stuff because yeah, man what a cool fucking instrument yeah it's awesome yeah it's cool instrument. dude john popper's solos were epic and uh there's a guy Ra- raul madon have you heard this dude absolutely he's, he's doing it he plays uh, harmonica yeah like sick really yeah. i've i've heard him like be sick mouth trumpet dude uh, uh also uh stevie stevie wonder still we still got yeah, him. Yeah, that's true. He'd be playing that Chromatica. And there's that French guy, too. I forget the name. Uh, the, he's been on those Charlie Hunter records playing oh, that yeah, Chromatica. Okay. Oh, man. So many name. great tunes on the, on the Charlie Hunter stuff. Oh, the harmonica. yeah, dude. Yeah. Uh, Charlie Hunter. That's just, he's a beast by a different man. We don't, get, we don't have time for that right now. Yeah. Um, this is the a comical question that I uh, horribly edited at one point that I still ask because it makes me feel stupid. And that question is, as written, Getty Lee or Getty Lee? Oh, man, I'm sorry. I'm going to expose my own ignorance. I don't know about Getty Lee. You don't know about Getty Lee? Just by name. Oh, okay. I don't well, know the Lord. It doesn't matter because the question as written is choose between the same person. So, Man, I have to study more up before I could settle on between Getty Lee or maybe it's Getty Lee. You know, the problem is, it's like, how do you pick? Getty Lee. All right. I'll say Getty Lee. But do you... But can you even decide between Getty Lee or Getty Lee? It's like it's the least fair question maybe ever. It's for, That's the hardest one for me. Live or session? Oh. 
man, hard to beat a good uh, live performance. Uh, I agree. Because that can, that can also be a session if it's That's turned true. into an album. That's true. I'll go with that. That's a good answer. I like your, uh, you got like parkour answers. Man, I'm like struggling be because. And then like somersaulting away from it or whatever. Man. <laughs> I'm trying. Yeah, I'm trying to straddle both both of each. Nah, you're you're doing it well. I I, I appreciate it. It's nimbly. Uh, well, these are hard. These are really hard ones. They're stupid, and I'm sorry, and I'm still sorry. Uh, to single coil or humbucker, as this is written. Uh, I'll say humbucker because that's what most of my experience with guitars has been. But that's only out of ignorance of not having more single coil guitars, which I'm trying to rectify in the future. So you're, you're getting a telly. Yeah, yep. P90 in there too. Oh, the next is the P90, right? That's that. That's the. Would you. Uh, is that single coil, actually? I twisted Tele? Yeah. Yep. It, it is a single toil. A single, it's an overwound single coil. And I don't. There's more nuance to it than that, okay. but I don't know. But that's the only P90 guitar that I have. And it does a lot. Okay. It's a really interesting. I just. I love it's it. It's cool. I love it. Um, do you, you said you do use a volume pedal. Do you use it before or after gain? Um, I have it on the front end from the guitar. Guitar to volume pedal to everything else. Okay. Yep. Do you use a volume knob as well? No. Uh, practically no because I'm worried there's dust in it and it's going to make noise. So you just you substituted the volume pedal for the pot? Yeah. Yeah. But the volume the volume pedal also doesn't uh, change the tone of the guitar either. Yeah, Not it doesn't change the the, the pickup. Yeah, and um, and I don't say that to d- detract. I don't do that because I don't think it would be good to like. I, a lot of great players do use their volume knobs and get and so gain, many people, gain output out of the pickup. Like that's really but there's cool. so many different like uh, like capacitance and resistor settings like that people use. Like for instance. All of my guitars, except for the 63 Strat, which is still totally original, uh, I have a treble bleed in. So okay. I can roll it all the way back, and the character of the pickup, in my opinion, stays the same. But I, it took me and a much smarter friend of mine, Chad Clifford from Fort Worth, uh, to get that sweet spot for me so that it just it rolls all the way back and it sounds the same yeah but it reduces the game but in just a completely even way a lot of people don't like that a lot of, i find that a lot of people like for the tone to darken as they roll it back too i just i can't use that so for whatever reason man i i haven't put much time into it but i definitely appreciate the guys who really know that and know how to do that i i don't have a volume pedal on my board but my volume knob on my guitar works like a volume pedal would that's my, awesome in my opinion it's really cool so uh I, and i feel like i'm uh definitely in minority of that uh do you have any compression or anything on your board no uh not not innately i guess just whatever compression happens Natural sometimes compression. with stuff yeah but what amp are you playing through man so i've i have usually used a, a fender deluxe reverb 65 reissue Okay. I've had a couple of different ones of those. I've had some of them modded out a little bit, like with new caps. and Yeah, yeah. I've never changed a speaker, which I think would be the a really a good choice for, for at least one of them. Yeah, yeah. Um, But lately I've been using a solid state deluxe, the, I think they call it Master Tone series. Tone Master. Tone Master, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And I like that. So I did this tour with John Hyatt and Jerry Douglas, and that was a great option because I was the only electric instrument, and there was a really um, low stage volume. And so by keeping that speaker off, I just sent them a DI signal at the back with the XLR. And you just had it coming through a monitor through mm-hmm. your ears. Or yep, something. and it sounds the same to my ears as it's sending out to them. So it's really consistent. Are, there, are you running ears on that? Yeah. Is yeah. everybody running ears on yeah, that? Yeah, everybody is. Okay, yeah. cool. Yep. Uh, oh, that's, that's cool to know that, uh, you know, dudes known for acoustic instruments are... are still running oh, ears oh man it's stuff. funny they well, have like talking, what was the name of that thing that uh the, oh the tone dexter yeah. yeah that's this fishman product that um records microphones and samples them into um different banks on there it's like an acoustic mini kemper kind of 
I guess so. I, I've never used the Kemper stuff, so I don't know from experience. I just know but. that you can plug your amps into it, and it will do the same thing that oh, you're talking like about with it. the microphones. Okay, yeah. that's awesome. Yeah, that's what it, that's doing on that with the mics. And um, everybody's got that. And um, I think the acoustic guys across the board in bluegrass, I certainly don't mean to speak for anybody because um, I, I feel like the odd man out in the bluegrass world playing electric guitar most of the time. But um, I see pedal boards come out for a lot of acoustic instruments, and I think it's cool and fun. It is cool. I mean, it's 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 essentially just being able to really fine tune whatever it is you hear for the sound of your instrument, yeah, and and, and being able to do that in a wide variety of acoustic environments, yeah, whether you're absolutely. playing an acoustic instrument or not. I think that's the point for pedals and guitars and amps and eq controls and volume yeah. controls and blah 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 right and it's fun just, though it's like how fast everything's changed over just a little short period of time is really immense so it's, it's hard a, to keep up with for me but like i i think it's cool it's, it's it, no it's it's totally cool but it's like it's almost a little bit of the same thing like we were talking about with uh the amount of uh artists work that there is to enjoy it's like there's so much that it's just hard to remember everything that you see where you're like, holy shit, that's amazing. And, and you know, let's let's say you're waiting in, in line to get on an airplane and then you don't think about it after you've landed and it's too late because who knows when you'll see it again. You've already forgotten about it. And, yeah. You know, that makes me sad. What if I'm missing out on something fun? <laughs> right i got fomo i got pedal fomo yeah bro. <laughs> Shit. Uh, that's real stupid i'm sorry no, no, um, uh, do you play any bass at all i do yeah i've got a um kind of like a frankenstein jazz bass at home i really like playing okay so my next question was going to be jazz or precision but i think i probably know the answer yeah i like the like jocko tone and playing back on the bridge i like that like punchy jocko um, gary willis yeah I like that. That like is yeah, a lot of attack. Yeah, just that the jazz bass bridge sound. It's it's like thin and like I would call it like burpy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I heard someone call it burpy once, and I was like, "That's pretty cool." Yeah, that sounds burpy. I always uh, thought like crunchy (laughs) or uh, or um uh, punchy. Yeah, it's definitely punchy. But the vocabulary always um, dissatisfies the meaning of the thing. I like how like the harder you dig in, you get almost kind of like an envelope sound to the attack. Yeah, I think that's what my uh, my man meant when he said when he called it burpy. Is just like the the env- just the envelope kind of a thing on the attack. Anyway, whatever. That's cool. extremely nerdy of me. Um, we're gonna get through this real quick. Okay. Uh. Do you have a favorite pedal? Yeah, if I had to just take one, I would take this uh, two-stage overdrive that I have. It's uh, my brother-in-law. He uh, made this pedal with Rodenberg. I think that's the company, uh, and it's just a nice two two gain stage pedal. Um, Send me a link to one. I'll put it into the show notes. Okay, sounds Can you do good. That? It's called the TB Drive tb drive yeah it's just a great overdrive i like it i used to have the full tone thing that i see over there in the background the full drive yeah do you know which version you had it looked exactly like that one uh the, all three versions kind of do okay i don't remember which like one. exactly with the the toggle in the middle i know it ran on 18 volts you could run it on 18 okay i think that's get... the mosfet okay that's the yeah, third, yeah it had a mosfet v, switch on v3 it. Yeah, yeah. okay yep. this is v2 uh, which has I don't even remember what the settings are on the toggle, and the first one had like a push pull volume and no toggle. Oh, okay. And I feel like there was a version zero too. There's I don't okay, know. Okay, yeah, I've I, seen different like boxes for them too, but I, that's what I replaced this with, and I love the Rodenberg thing. It's it's cool. I forget what the uh, numbers are on it. All right, because we we got like two and a half minutes left, all so right. I quickly and right. you have to be quick. Lightning round. Three Desert Island records off the top of your head, no deliber- no deliberation. Okay, uh, you're deliberating. Led Zeppelin, BBC Sessions Live. Okay, uh, I'm gonna link all of these. By the way, Miles Davis, Phillies Day, Kilimanjaro, and uh, shit, man. 
uh, Glenn Gold Goldberg variations. Okay. This is really long. You get a lot of discs on that. Hell yeah. Uh, recommendation for album of the week. It can be different than those three. I would like for it to be different than those three. Oh, shit. Um, well, this is what I've been listening to. I checked out the JD and Domi. Yeah. Record JD has, Beck, Dallas boy. Yeah. Hell yeah. It's got a lot of cool guests on it. Kurt Rosenwinkel has a cameo on there. A couple, I think. Um, I think Herbie's on there. Snoop Herb, got, Herbie's on there. Snoop and Snoop Thundercat. Is on there. Thundercat. Yeah. Anderson. Anderson Pock. Yeah. I think Anderson Pock uh, paid to put that out. Produced it. Yeah. Very cool. Uh, and Thundercat had something to do with producing it as well, I think. It's awesome. And lastly, I'm putting you in the King's Court. Real quick, everyone has to go through this, and you have to choose one of the following kings. Albert, BB, Freddie, Earl, Carol, or King's X? Shit, uh, Albert King. Albert King, there you have it. Ladies and gentlemen, all of our thanks to Mike Seal for joining us today. I don't know that there's any ladies that are watching this, but uh, <laughs> by the slim chance that my mom watches. Hi, Mom. Yeah. Um, I, I will link to Mike's sites. I will uh, definitely make specific links to the four videos where I found you. Just amazing player, amazing playing, great dude. It's been great hanging with you, man. Likewise. Um, uh, I'll link your record. Uh, I will link my record. I'll link my second record that comes out uh, October the 25th on everywhere. You can pre-order it now. Uh, and once again, thanks, man. Appreciate you. Man, thanks a lot for having me. Till next time on Gear and Beer. Mike Seal, Robert Miller. Peace out. Hey, thanks for listening to the Gear and Beer podcast. We would ask that you please be sure to tell your friends about the podcast. And if you haven't already, subscribe and follow our Instagram and YouTube channels, as well as liking and commenting on our posts. Are there guests you want to see on the podcast? Topics you want us to talk about or pieces of gear? Let us know. All these kinds of things feed the algorithms in a positive way and help us gain more traction, whereby enabling us to continue to bring you ever-improving content and guests. Thanks again, gearheads. We truly appreciate your support, and we'll see you back here soon for another episode of... Dear.